don't underestimate the skills that you've learned. People, if you sometimes get caught up on the tasks that you do, and I've tried to really sort of understand to myself is put the task aside for one moment and understand the skills you're actually learning. And once you understand the skills you can learn, you you, then you'll be able to better articulate whether you go to another job interview or whatever it might be, is how those skills correlate to another role, which could be in a completely different business. And I use it like stakeholder management or, you know, there's endless other different skills um, that you can actually use from one job to another when I'm necessarily getting caught up in the task. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. My name is James Grixon, and today I'm joined by the former Hawthorne football player, the now high performance coaching coordinator for Cricket Australia, Andrew Bosley. Andrew, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. All the way from the Northern Territory, mate. We we're just talking off offline, the great NT. What what brought you up there? Yeah, it's quite a funny scenario how it all happened. I was um, on stand down while Cook Australia were going through um, that period uh, with um, COVID hit. So I was sort of working from home uh, in metropolitan Melbourne and just uh, was talking to a friend of mine who said that he's going to down to play footy and it did cross my mind to do it. And I was sitting there at the uh, kitchen table thinking, where else would I want to work from? I could get outside, not wear a mask. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another uh, formal approval from HR sort of helped that and um, yeah did quarantine in the facility up in Darwin and uh, been there for probably about last two and a half three months which uh, has been refreshing to sort of change the scenery given the circumstances particularly what's going on with Melbourne but good to see it's uh, hopefully turning around down there. Yeah it certainly does look like that but I'm sure for you you were um, you know quietly happy with your choice given given what did happen uh, and the NT's pretty much been back to normal for, for a long time so uh, you, you've done you've done quite well there, my friend. You mentioned that you are playing footy, and uh, as I alluded to at the top of the call, a, a former player spent uh, a year and a half, nearly two years, with the Hawthorne Football Club. I, I want to talk through your journey because that that was you know that, that almost feels like a lifetime ago for you, I, I'm sure. And it, it, it was it was a few years ago, and that we have been a few years removed from that period in your life, and you're now working inside of sport, but you know, as a high performance coaching coordinator. I want to actually take a few steps back to when you were you know, maybe possibly even at high school looking to get into the, those development squads and, and the idea of, okay, I'm going, to be a, you know, I'm going to be an athlete or it looks like I'm going to be an athlete. At least I want to be an athlete. I want to play professional football. What is, what is the thought process for you at that time? Is it tunnel vision football only or are you having something in the back of your head uh, saying, you know what, I, I need to either go via education or I, I need to have some sort of side business happening. Were you putting different eggs in different baskets or were you tunnel vision? Yeah, I was, I was probably what you define as a late bloomer. I thought I always had the talent to play, but I wasn't involved in any talent programs through my teenage years or whatnot. I've always loved sport, whether it be footy, cricket, whatever it might be. I was always a kid in the backyard like most, um, most kids were. And, I actually wanted to be a physio because I thought, well, a physio would be really good to be close to, this, um, to the scene of the team and whatnot. Um, so I actually got into exercise sports science uh, after year 12. Um, and I deferred that for a year to concentrate on footy. Um, I was involved in a talent program that year. So I thought, well, kind of worked out well. I took a gap year, put all my eggs in my basket to have a crack at footy. Um, if I didn't get drafted, then I was going to go off and do exercise sports science. Um, so, yeah. Juggling, obviously, um, high school and footy was quite easy as such. I was at an all-boys school, which uh, made a good environment to uh, play footy and play with your mates and whatnot. But, yeah, it was probably not until where I um, getting drafted became a bit more of a reality drew sort of like my 18, 19-year-old age. And, um, yeah, very fortunate to get that opportunity to get rookie listed to Hawthorne, which sort of ended study because obviously I had to let go of that, um, that course and um, try and find my way into a professional sporting environment, which, um, yeah, for two years, it was a great experience and it actually opened my eyes to understanding how business meets sport. Um, and that really gave me sort of a catalyst to understand really at the cold face what sort of opportunities that were, which then at a time when I was going to be delisted or start to study again. 
um, the sports management stream, particularly the business side of it. I didn't really give much thought. I thought I wouldn't really like the, the business elements as um, uni. It really gave me sort of an understanding of actually if I study these, this, these are some opportunities that might come out. And hence why I think that's why the segue I found my way into Cricket Australia through that avenue. And um, But yeah, seeing that from a um, professional athlete perspective, definitely gave me some probably insights at, at an age where I hadn't done four years of university yet and then gone into the taste of the environment. I was able to get a really good look at professional practice and be in and be being an athlete, but also you're around a lot of people that are making business decisions for a team or organisation. So quite lucky how that sort of unfolded for me through my junior years and then moving into a professional career. That's interesting that you say that, mate, about how, you know, where sport meets business. And I, I think at that age, sort of that 18 to 24 age bracket, that understanding, you know, obviously it takes time for that sort of uh, synergy to happen in your brain. And, you know, certainly uh, that's when the synergy happened in my brain. But uh, the, people that, the people that typically would be watching now, they would have had a similar path, right? You know, and everyone really, I feel, that, that gets into sport has a similar path at that age. They might not have gone to the levels of, of, of being drafted like you, but they've just been, they've been passionate in sport. They want to work in sport. They're still trying to figure out you know, some, uh, do I want to have a crack at this or do I want to go the other way and sort of follow the academic route? What, what was the, the synergies that you saw between sport and business during that time at around what you said, you know, 18, 19, 20, where you went, gee, I really need to start probably thinking about an education in business because the parallels here are, are something that I can really get into. Yeah, it was, it was quite interesting because I think once I got in there, obviously you're just trying to um, do whatever you can to play the game you love and play at the highest level. But it's more the interaction. So obviously you meet the CEO of the, of the football club, first of all, and then you start meeting operations managers and whatnot. And then you start having conversations with them and you're quite lucky, I suppose, with the different sort of sponsors and um, members that you might have touch points with, you'd sort of learn about their stories a little bit more. And mm. it sort of just came from conversations and um, I'm quite passionate about athlete wellbeing. And um, so then seeing the role of, well, a player welfare manager or a player development manager is really on the inner sanctum, but then understanding, you know, they're either a teacher or they've studied business or, you know, they've also got their targets, which we now talk about a lot in the corporate world. But understanding sort of their strategic objectives and why they do something then sort of gave me a real understanding well maybe sports management is great but i still want to know the why something happens and i think that's also comes from just personally being curious about how decisions are made you know why are we spending x amount to do this versus and what the outcomes we might get or what sort of goals are driven behind decisions or a list management perspective mm. well list management you're dealing with contracts so understanding how to read a, a legal document how to interpret that, whatnot. So then I was sort of going, well, yeah, based on some business degree, it was sort of at least help me create those different um, connections and sponsorship was probably the big one. We're going through a transition between using Puma as our apparel sponsor to the Adidas yeah. and just thinking about, oh, that's actually someone's job. Someone's job is actually to go out and get corporate sponsorship for apparel and then try and understand what skills or what studies they might have done to get those roles, given they were still involved in the um, performing the performing environment. And you mentioned there about the, the wellbeing officer as an example, and you use the words in a sanctum, um, while different roles call, call for different, you know, elements of being, you know, how, how inside are they? You know, from, from my viewpoint, not being inside of a club, but being sort of on a, a vendor side, even, even in my role, you know, my office is filled with people that love sport just as much as, as, uh, uh, as I do, and I'm sure that those people in those corporate roles are in uh, for for a football club are in the same position. So I can see how you've gone. Oh, geez, you know, I probably do need to learn about contracts because that way I can apply. You know, for, for after footy, that way I can apply those skills into this environment and still be in an environment where everyone loves sport, but there's just there's other you know there's business functions that need to be done. So that that would have been certainly interesting to pick up at a at a younger age. Do you, would you say that that yes. sort of pick up happens by a lot of football players at that age? Do a lot of football players see that parallel or synergy? Um, I think there is, it's becoming more and more evident. I think particularly mm. is, you know, um, players start to tell the story a bit more and yeah. using either player associations or um, wellbeing managers, whatever it might be, to really understand that, you know, I think a statistic got told me at quite a young age that the average career is three years. So, mm. 
know, I think as, as kids growing up, you want to be a 300 game player or you want to be a, the opening batsman for Australia or you want to go to the NBA, whatever sport it may be, you always see the top and the pinnacle, but reality is the 1% to get there or much, much, much less than that. But um, I think it's definitely important to keep striving for that to be the best person you can be from an athlete perspective, but also be conscious in mind about what is next or what's your identity and not always necessarily identifying yourself to the sport as an athlete, but identifying yourself as a person and then thinking about what else you can bring to um, life after footy, whatever it might be. But I'm definitely noticing that there's more people probably getting into that, mm. the business side of things and particularly whether it be, um, you know, sponsorship or, you know, account managing, whatever it might be, there's a whole range of different um, degrees of stuff. I think understanding the environments and particularly in sport, being involved in a team, you can actually make those connections and those stakeholder relations, which you probably haven't realised that you do on a day-to-day basis. You're dealing with like uh, medical staff, coaches, fellow players, uh, dealing with membership. You're probably getting dragged to do player appearances if it may be, if you're lucky enough. So you're dealing with a whole range of people. I think sometimes athletes forget how um, their stakeholder management skills can be increased just without even really knowing, to be honest. Oh, and I, and I guess that was sort of, one of the key allures, not that I know this from personal experience, but, you know, just just from seeing, okay, you know, a player finishes their career, I, I'm a business, I'm a company, and, you know, it's really hard to, to get in front of these key people. Footballers came out with that skill set, you know, just with them because they had the relationships. Like you said, they built those stakeholder relationships. Um, they built that ability to communicate with those people over so many years. So, you know, initially it was, okay, we need to get a, a, an ex-footballer in for those relationships. And obviously, you know, they wanted to be upskilled and, and transition into the next part of their lives. But now I see it more and more happening, obviously with the accessibility of social media and how, I, I, I guess, um, easier it is. or, or the, I think it, it seems more... I guess, hip or popular. Like it, it, you, you see it happen across um, the globe. You see it happen at a, a younger and younger ages, people starting to be associated with certain brands and do, you know, shout outs or sponsorships or, or, or ads yeah. online. So it's, it's really, really cool to see because that's something that I'm, I'm passionate about it is, you know, the, the blend of sport and business. Cause it, like you had said that you were observed, it is so, so close. But to be in a business environment where everyone cares as much about sport as you do is, you know, it's almost a bit of a dream. Um, yeah. I, I want to talk about your transition into, you know, you, you mentioned a well-being officer as one of your key roles. We, oh, geez, that's pretty interesting. You actually became a well-being officer. You, you sat there at the at the um, the Northern Night, Nights for a little while there as a as a well-being coordinator. Um, talk to me about those sorts of roles. It seems like that's quite a common transition for some players. What was that transition like out of, you know, athlete life into sort of more, um, I, I guess, a supporter of that environment, that athletic environment? Yeah, unfortunately, it was uh, quite a role that was short-lived given with um, with all the COVID and the stand-downs that the AFL had. But, um, yeah, I was lucky enough to a short period of time to be involved with the Northern Knights under our program. And um, I was quite lucky I had a sort of connection there where I did a bit of placement while I was at uni. Um, working in the operations team there and um, I think for me I was like I feel like I'm a lucky one to transition out of the AFL environment even though I've been two years and actually started a career and really look upon that time fondly but having a lot of close friends that have gone through similar pathways to me they've sort of, it's almost been detrimental at times to either life post footy or be able to find their way either because yeah. they haven't financially set up and to me, it's, I'm really passionate about that space. And I think the, the younger you can sort of, um, I think about my time when I went through the exact same program and you really got, you're having conversations with player, player managers that are trying to sign you up at 18. You're, um, you're dealing with sort of maybe your parents not knowing how to cope with maybe the, the child being the limelight. You know, you got, you cover from a small bubble of local football team into a more of a sort of a pathway program. And, Quite lucky that, yeah, I was able to, to sort of share some of my wisdom with some of those guys who were 10 years younger than me and sort of talk through about my experiences and not only my experiences, but I thought, is there anything I can partake on them? And also to probably look at a more of a bigger picture around, you know, sport is really good, but it's also about, well, there's also a big part of your life that you also need to um, grapple with. And sometimes when you're at that age, it's just footy, footy, footy. And I was definitely one of them, but to almost to sort of take a step back and make sure, you know, it's very topical at the moment with mental health and mm. well-being, and um, particularly with obviously with COVID, what's going on, it's really high, not just in sport, but just across everyday life. Now people living at home, also working from home. 
but yeah, just sort of going through some some small skills and like I did a uh, currently completing my cert for elite athlete wellbeing, and sort of using some of those skills that I'll learn in the classroom now to push them into sort of some programs of the Northern Knights about how we educate, I suppose, um, young teenagers about how to be more self-aware of themselves, like what are some pressing points for them where they might become stressed or some other ways that we can actually sort of, yeah, make themselves more aware about the triggers and then how to sort of, sort of deal with those triggers and reaching out for support, I think is also such a hard one, particularly for young people, they might not know where to turn to and they turn to their friends. So um, yeah, a, a role short lived in, recent, in regards to how it all unfolded with COVID, but yeah, being involved in their playing camp um, over pre-season and training with the kids and whatnot is, um, Quite rewarding and probably a space that I'll eventually love to transition at some point in time in my life, I'd imagine. No, I, I did want to start there, obviously, cricket being the next or sort of the next topic of discussion for us, obviously, you know, a longer stint there. But I did want to start there and um, because, yeah, like, like I said, it seems to be a natural progression for for former players or former athletes to, to get into that role and get into that environment. And there was a couple of interesting things that you said, and, and I just want to dovetail off that, that I think self-awareness, at, at least for me, or, or, or coping mechanisms, probably more to the point, uh, just on that, that topic, something that I, I, I really, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that I really drive home just for myself personally. You know, how do, how do you have those coping mechanisms to go, okay, I'm going to be okay um, because I know what to do here or I'm not going to be the okay, case, so and then we do reach out. So I think that's great. And I just wanted to highlight that. Um, the, the other thing that you said is at that age, it's footy, 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 and you were gu- guilty of it as well. I'm interested in your thought, and I know it's not, you know, you'll probably say, oh, you know, I've, my, my, my word isn't the be-all and end-all, but I am interested in your thought on what is the, what is the appropriate split for, for an athlete, in your opinion? Where should they be, how should they be sort of framing their viewpoint? It's going to depend person to person, and I completely understand that. But um, obviously tunnel vision on footy may not necessarily be the best way to go about it because you do end up coming out the other side, um, potentially with some, you know, some things not set up in your life. What would you say the best split is for, for an individual during their career? I think it definitely, and this is going to sound very cliche for multiple, multiple reasons, but it definitely comes down to individual, I think. Mm-hmm. I think if you've got support and the ability, whether it be um, to put all your eggs in one basket and have a crack at a professional sport, encourage it. Because you don't want to go to bed at night and, and head hit the pillow and go, mm-hmm. I wish I could have done this, I wish I could have done that. I think, like, I definitely sleep better than I know that I gave it my all and I felt like I'd come up short without playing an AFL game. But I know like, I gave everything I could at the time to be the best player I could be. So I think it's really important to be able to, you know, within yourself, know if you want to really do something, just to go 100% into it. Because you're not going to be able to, well, even when you're doing it in an environment, you still need to be putting 100% of effort into it to still make it. And I'm sure if you speak to any of the uh, professional athletes that had 15 year careers, gone to the Olympics, whatever it might be, hopefully they would attest to that, that you really need to be all in. So it definitely comes down to the individual, I think, around what's important to them and how much do they want it. I think the more you, the more you want something, the more you're going to invest time in it. But it's also you to be conscious of, well, you know, can I financially do that or where do I live or mm. how important are my relationships outside of sport, whether you might have a partner or your family. You do make a lot of sacrifices um, to give you an I think about my short journey where I was around 18, 19 and I was neglecting 18th birthday parties. I was not going to things, I was probably not going to a few outings where, you know, the average 18 year old might, but that was a sacrifice I was willing to make because I wanted to play for football. So it definitely comes down to the individual about, we talk about the values a lot, um, about what, you know, what they value and what's important to them in life. And I think that we talk about the self-awareness and education is the more aware you are what drives you, you can then make the decisions of what it might be, whether you go, you know what, I'll play as high as I sport as I can, but I've also got to equally put as much time into my relationships or I've got to put equally as time into, um, you know, seeing myself up financially might be, or you might be really driven to buy a house, so you obviously need income to do that. So your scenario is definitely going to um, best depict where you've invested your time. But in the core of it, it comes down to deep, deep down what you really want to do and how you can sleep at night with those decisions you make. I like how you link back to self-awareness there, mate. That's a... Uh... That's, that's a good callback. So, uh, and I appreciate your, your comments there and I, and I understand that the tough spot I might have put you in um, with a, you know, sort of give me an answer type, type question. Uh, I want to talk about your time in cricket, obviously sort of um, 
you know, from November 2017 to now you've been involved with Cricket Australia in a couple of different roles, you know, through events, um, working as an intern, but now more recently sort of a coaching coordinator and specifically now the high performance coaching coordinator. Had, had you been a, a cricket fan or a cricket player growing up? What was the, what was the allure into, into the Cricket Australia environment? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. I get this question asked a lot, given um, how heavily my background is tailored to um, Aussie rules. But um, it all started actually where the university I chose to attend had a internship for their final semester. Um, and for someone who was transitioning out of 40, I was like, well, I kind of need to be forced to get involved and get my hands dirty in professional practice. So I ended up choosing, choosing University Federation University down in Ballarat. Yeah. And... Uh, I knew that they really put a high price on professional practice as part of their subject. So I thought there's no way I can get out of this, I have to do it. Kind of forcing my own hand a little bit. And it was during that internship where, um, unbeknownst to me, the Creek Australia had a, um, a partnership with Federation University, like a lot of other sporting organisations. Um, so through, through the uni actually, I applied for an internship through Cricket Australia. So it was pretty much like a, a full blown job interview, resume um, interview and whatnot. So, um, I had a, like I chose Cricket Australia because I needed something to think a little bit different. I, I had a lot of football experience. And I thought, well, if I'm to be employable, lay down the track, and my resume is all around one sport, mm. am I going to be more appealing to someone that has a variety of different experiences? So I was very keen and quite lucky that there was an internship um, available at Cricket Australia, which I applied for, and um, lucky enough that Cricket Australia appointed me for the gig. So I think my first role was. Uh, indoor cricket and club association intern and I had no idea about what indoor cricket was I just knew that if I get a foot in an organisation like Cricket Australia um, I'll be able to learn from a lot of different people I knew that um, previous students had a really good experience there um, they had a long list of interns that have gone there previously before me so I knew at least well, it would give me some good experience 14 weeks full time like working environment um, I thought you know so I was travelling up I was living in Geelong at the time going to university in Ballarat but then driving or catching the train up to Melbourne to uh, get paid nothing for 14 weeks full time while I try and um, cut me cloth at being a sports administrator. And yeah, I'm quite lucky that um, at, the, at the end of the intern, uh, an events role popped up in a really short term contract at the team I was working in. So I effectively rolled straight into that um, events uh, role. Uh, again, short term contract, there's four months. I'm like trying to find that elusive full time ongoing um, role. Um, that contract finished, I think, in uh, around February of 2018. And, um, I was actually technically unemployed for two weeks and I applied for the, uh, my co the coaching coordinator role within Cricket Australia. And um, I didn't hear about anything and so I was in the lurch for two weeks thinking, what am I going to do? I, was, I still enjoyed being involved in cricket. I loved cricket as a kid. I think most boys would always either play backyard or beach cricket back when they were um, young. So, you know, especially when the summer came along, all the test matches are on TV and you're watching with your old man. Um, so, yeah, there was definitely passion. I've lost you, Andrew. Sorry about that, folks. Just a bit of technical difficulties there. Andrew, thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks for jumping back on. Everyone knows the struggles of Zoom. So, Andrew, as you were saying, um, you, the two-week transition period or a two week unknown between that events contract and what was going to be your coaching coordinator role. You, you obviously still wanted to be involved in cricket. Uh, let's, let's pick up where you left off there, my friend. Yeah, no worries. Sorry about that. Being uh, <laughs> in rural Darwin, it's got its challenges and um, yeah, I was surprised no. the, uh, the Wi-Fi didn't break on any sooner. So um, yeah, so like I said, uh, I had two weeks sort of where I was in a bit of the wilderness. I was unsure what I want to do and I was still very keen to be involved in cricket. Um, I applied for the coaching coordinator role while I was working still at Cricket Australia in that events role. Uh, but there was a little bit unknown about what was going to happen with that role. And um, yeah, ended up getting a phone call. Um, actually, uh, yeah, after two weeks, I've been sort of off wondering what I was going to do, saying I've got the job and sort of came back, which is quite interesting because I uh, sort of had like a farewell party and you know, oh. thanks for your time and your services. And I've, I've literally rolled in and it was like, oh, I thought you left. I'm like, yeah, I've actually uh, come back and I've got this role, which is um, quite interesting. And even that role in itself was uh, only a four-month contract as well. So mm -hmm. that only went up to June 30. So, um, yeah, like I said before, I, was, I loved cricket and I was really passionate about it. I think like most boys are playing beach cricket or whatnot in the backyard. And um, 
I just knew that I was, I still want to learn more, particularly being an international sport as well. Yeah. And um, I sort of actually got the job and then almost had to uh, tell or sell to the executive general manager there at the time, which I believe was uh, Pat Howard about um, why this job is so important in Australian cricket so then I could become ongoing. So I went from almost like an intern for 14 weeks, um, short-term contract for four months, another short-term contract for four months, and then no sooner did I get the job, I had to then explain to them the powers of B, why my role is so important. So uh, how did obviously, that did go? A good job, uh, obviously did a good job and explained yeah. how um, critical the role was for Australian cricket. And um, yeah, so we got that role and then in coaching coordinator, if you don't mind me interrupting there, Andrew, I love hearing stories where people have, or people have, you know, displayed such initiative like that, right? So you've gone, I want to roll, you know, I want to keep working here. I think this is really important. I know my contract ends at, the, at, at this time, but here's why you need to keep me on. Here's why you need the role to stay on. Just talk me through, I, I know at the time, it, 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 it almost seems like it's second nature or a, in, instinctual to sort of kick in yeah. and start doing those things. But if you can at all reflect on that period of time, the three months leading in, maybe the one month where you've gone, oh, hang on here, we need to we need to extend this. A, I want to roll, but B, I think this is actually a really important job. Um, and then the actual presentation to Pat, talk, re- reflect on that for me if you if you can. Yeah, it was it, it was definitely a daunting exercise, but um, I knew speaking to a few people within the organisation of the gap that role would leave for other people, and I thought, well. You're dead right. I want a role. I need. I want. A, I want a job. I didn't go to uni for four years. Where I want a job, and that was obviously um, really a sort, of, sort of driving to make sure. Well, I've got a chance here. Let's take with both hands and conversation with my manager. It was kind of in his best interest as well to make sure that I went on full time as well to allow him to perhaps to do some more managerial tasks and whatnot. So within our small team, everyone wanted me to stay, but obviously I had to sell that message um, to both. Um, to well, the executive general manager and sort of the broader business given you know, you can't have a dollar, so to speak. So I think it was a, uh, he said, don't worry about making a PowerPoint. So I made a PowerPoint um, <laughs> just because I sort of needed it. He was, um, this is all via virtually as well because he was up in um, Queensland at the time. Right. And the Brisbane office, I was down in Melbourne. So I went into a little room and I was sort of having notes together and I remember just having, all right, this is, this is like the six core things that I'm going to do. And if I don't do them, someone else has got to do them. And if someone else has got to do them, it means that they're losing capability to do the majority of their role. So then I'd go, oh, you know, so I'm going to be sending out these newsletters and I'm going to be doing this and I'm going to be doing that. And he goes, how many? I'm like, um, and I sort of had to notes and whatnot about how much should it be. So it was really interesting, even at that point in time, to really understand from an executive general manager's mm. point of view, what were they going to get from the output that I was going to give? Like what was actually something that was measurable? And even there's a little sort of light bulb moment where even though I knew what I was doing was critically important, I think it was really important for me to see at a young age and for saying for my career how important it was at a really high level to understand, you know, strategic outcomes, how to count every dollar, you know, what, what, how we're going to measure success, given that sport is sometimes very hard to measure success as well. Yeah. Um, so that was even just a, a learning in itself, you know, um, showcasing the importance of my role to Australian cricket and what I'd be doing in my 40 hours per week that will really service the Australian cricket ecosystem. And more importantly, um, cricket coaches around Australia and even internationally to that perspective. That's a really important, thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's a really important message around, you know, sort of that, that light bulb moment, but just the initiative, you know, I think opportunities in, in this industry or in sport, just in general, don't really come up, you know, so when, when they do and you've got, if someone's left the door open just a little bit, you know, you've got to, you've got to stick your foot in there and then just throw your whole body through and, and take it. So yeah, thank you for sharing. I think so too as well. It's, um, you know, backing your ability in as well. Like I was obviously set up quite young and, um, you know, you're always unsure about yourself going into any yeah. environment, whatever it might be, whether it be a sporting team, um, you know, corporate, whatever it might be, um, sport organisation, no matter how big or small. And, but I sort of just thought, no, well, You'd have obviously with the conversation stuff. It's hard to get sometimes. You know, talk about that self awareness piece again. But you know, you're really good at well. If I'm not confident in my ability, how can I expect someone to be confident in me? So then I thought, you know, well, if I'm confident in myself and betray that, um, even though I was shivering in my boots, thinking this could be make or break, um, <laughs> you definitely sort of sort of take that persona a little bit, and um, yeah, it's held me good stead thus far. Uh, yeah, I, I could go all day about that topic. Um, that's that's something you know. 
everyone's just as scared as you are, basically, is what I'm, find, what I'm finding out. Some people just have good poker faces. Um, I, I'm interested in that, in that switch to, to coaching, right? So you, you've gone from an athletic um, background and then you, you've studied management and, and sort of you know, business um, and then worked you know, in events and then internships or the internship prior was around sort of just club you know, management. What was, had you picked up a coaching sort of accreditation or experience during that time that led to the, the co coaching role? No, not particularly. The role that it started off, it was actually a really sort of support coordinating role. Okay. So effectively supporting the coaches. So yes. that's how it originally started with, you know, um, so looking after a lot of our uh, digital platforms to sit behind what we right. do. Right. Yep. So you yep. know, you talk about you talk about accreditation coach, accreditation courses. So dealing with a lot of like administrative tasks, like no, we've lost him again. <laughs> Another technical issue. Sorry, there, folks. That's uh, that's Darwin Wi-Fi. <laughs> Having been in uh, been born in Darwin, I completely understand the struggle, Andrew. So. Don't worry, mate. All good. Uh, you're uh, you're explaining the the role there, the transition into the high performance coaching, well, the coaching coordinator to begin with, and then yep. the, and the role itself. Because uh, I had asked about whether there was a actually a coaching um, accreditation that you had, and you were sort of explaining that, and then the transition of the high performance coaching coordinator. So, rip in my yeah, head. yeah. Sorry about that, and um, <laughs> thank you. But um, yeah. So the role was actually heavily around sort of supporting the coaches across our network. So, you know, being a centralised point to support the coaches that are delivering coach education across the country, and then obviously having our strategic um, measures around, you know, how we sort of from Australian cricket perspective, how we sort of deliver coaching across the country. So a lot of back end systems, whether it be the digital platforms that we use, um, obviously collecting coaching data to be able to use that data to then really make some tailored. Um, coach education opportunities. So a lot of it was administrative um, based and then it sort of evolved a little bit where we had a bit of a restructure and I was able to push into a more high performance role. Um, and again, it was pretty much just my role, but really making it tailored to the high performing area. So, um, you know, really dealing with sort of our elite coaches in state territories where they coach Sheffield Shield or BBL and sort of how do we give them some coach education for the elite. So I worked previously and still do to some extent work around community cricket and you know our e-learning platform and providing online learning so we can reach any coach as far as wide given that we know 90% of our coaches sit in that community landscape. Mm. But then yeah transitioning to the elite is about well you know we we talk about back before about you know an elite a, a elite athlete transitioning into the corporate world has elite athlete or anyone for that matter transition to coaching as well. You know, they've obviously got the professional skills, but how do we develop the intra and interpersonal skills where they might have had experience presenting in front of a group? So then, you know, how do we find some professional development opportunities for those elite coaches, you know, to be able to help develop them? Because given when you're at that level, you know, you're seen to be the expert, but we still need to make sure that we're developing the next wave of whether it be Australian coaches or state and territory coaches. And I just provide a centralised support um, from a cricket Australia perspective for the whole network. and. Um, yeah, like the level three high performance course as an example is, you know, looking after that and running that and then making sure we're finding facilitators that really hit the mark about, okay, what's some of the outcomes we want for our elite coaches? What's some things we want to learn? They're obviously going to learn in their own ways and through their own organisation as well. But from a cricket shape standpoint, how can we sort of develop that whole ecosystem and ensure that the, the calibre of coaching goes from here to here? So, um, yeah, that's hopefully a bit of a, a snapshot of... yeah. Um, again, I'm just conscious of my Wi-Fi my break again. So, um, yeah, that's probably gives you a bit of a mix of the uh, the both roles I've had within the coaching department. Yeah, mate. And, and it sounds like you're very passionate about it too. Um, yeah. Uh, go on. No, I was going to say, yeah. And I think for me personally, like I'm starting to transition into coaching in my um, fo football team as well. And I can really see, I suppose, and understand being an athlete before that how critical a coach does play in an athlete's role, not just for the love of the game at a junior level, but right through to the elite. Um, yep. And it's sort of giving, to be able to sort of have some impact in some capacity across the Australian cricket ecosystem, it's um, yeah, quite a fortunate position to be in. Absolutely, mate. And, you know, with everything that's happening in the world, there's, I think, one thing in cricket, co coaches won't go away. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that you still need coaches and... Coaches still need resources and coaches still need developing. So, um, yeah, for, fortunate is a good word to use. 
One thing uh, I did want to bring up before I pose my last question to you was just uh, what I've noticed throughout your, your entire story. You know, there was, some, there was moments where you were talking about initiative and, and sort of picking up on things earlier in your career around the football club. One thing I have noticed that you've brought up, I don't know if it's consciously or subconsciously, but you've talked about diversity. So you'd spoken about how, um, you know, you went, oh, I don't want to be that person who's just been in football. Let's go to cricket. Um, I want to go to cricket, not because it's another sport, but also because it's an international sport. So there, there's something that you're thinking, oh, I really need to have a, a diverse skill set. And I will either parlay um, that point into my question. You can follow on or you might want to um, add on to, to, to with another point. But the last question I typically ask guests is if you were, if you were sitting in a position where you're um, either you know, sort of at university, in our industry, in the sport industry, what would be your advice or guidance or, and you can pick, you can pick either or, or and or if you were somebody who has had some experience within the industry and is looking to transition into another sport or, or another role, what would be your, your words of advice for, for those people? Um, yes. Yeah, so the two probably great questions you posed. And um, for me, it was sort of just taking all the opportunities that I could come across. So um, yeah, quite lucky that, I've done a whole different variety of roles in a short period of time. It sort of just led to one another. And um, I got some advice when I was going to that before you think you should be trying everything. And I try and put my sort of my own mindset in a general manager's role or a CEO's role, whatever that might be. You know, they're across a lot of different um, departments and they're going to make a lot of So for me, it's like, well, you know, if I need to be that role, sort of what can I, what do I need to know? What, so to be able to sort of have some really understand across the whole business and a variety of different roles will hopefully give me some uh, the best chance because I'm really un- well, keen to understand the why. Um, the more you understand the why, the more strategic you can make those decisions. Um, I actually read a book called Range and I forget the, the, the author of that book, but it talks about being a, uh, a generalist in a specialised world. <laughs> there you go. It's a good read. It's not up at all. It's actually um, one of my most favourite books and it really detests that, that because, yeah, I thought, well, you know, the more I know about a lot of different things at a sort of a, a deep level, but not a really specialised level, um, the more informed I can be to make some um, better decisions. And it's really important, I suppose, from when you, you're starting out is that don't underestimate the skills that you've learned. People, if you get, sometimes you get caught up on the tasks that you do. And I've tried to really sort of understand to myself is put the task aside for one moment and understand the skills you're actually learning. And once you understand the skills you can learn, you under, you, then you'll be able to better articulate whether you go to another job interview or whatever it might be, is how those skills correlate to another role, which could be in a completely different business. And I'll use it like stakeholder management or, you know, there's endless other different skills um, that you can actually use from one job to another but not necessarily getting caught up in the task. So, yeah, don't underestimate the skills you would use. And um, I'm definitely a test to trying to be um, a generalist across a lot of different functions, um, particularly when you're probably going to be going to, um, applying to jobs that are in high um, high roles, they want to know that what the understanding you may or may not have. So oh, looking for that lens, I'm in good stead so far. Mate, I couldn't agree more. And for those, yes, it wasn't set up. Just having to be on my desk. Uh, David Epstein, pretty well known book, and, and been out for a while. But uh, yeah, very. I can't believe you said that. So <laughs> and the book's just there. But um, Andrew, through what's and all, mate, through a few uh, internet interruptions. Thank you for joining. It's been fantastic to have you on. The story that you've had, the transition that you've made. Uh, thank you very much for making the time. Uh, for those that are watching and they want to watch more and you want to subscribe, you can click down there. If you want to watch the last interview I did, uh, you can click up here. For Andrew, uh, my name is James and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining.